Rosemary Bray McNutt, who's the president of our seminary in Berkeley, last year came and she said, we know each other from the New York area, she said, I came because I knew you would talk about Jesus. So enjoy the bunnies on the cover. They are a miracle, in part because we wonder how they can have so many babies and still look so calm and well coiffed. But we won't be talking about them today. Today, of course, is the day that many Christians celebrate the incredible miracle that they believe took place over 2,000 years ago on that day when Jesus, sentenced to death for no real crime, tortured to death by crucifixion, was witnessed alive again. As Sherry shared with the children, Jesus laid previously in a tomb is left through the Sabbath day until his body can be washed ritually and prepared for burial by, in the version of Matthew that I read from as I was preparing two women, but you know there are different versions in our tradition. Mary Magdalene, not this Mary. <laughs> Mary, the mother of James, not this Mary. Standing in front of the tomb, these women, at least in the version Matthew tells, feel the earth shake and the rock rolls back and an angel appears to them or some, some presence or specter so radiant and so otherworldly that they know it, understand it to be an angel, to say that Jesus is alive and will come to them and they leave to give word to the other disciples, seeing Jesus on the way to tell the other disciples, and the disciples then later seeing Jesus, the other disciples seeing Jesus themselves. In the end, at the last of these two encounters, when the risen Jesus departs, he does so, but not before telling them he will be with them always for eternity. And that's the end of the Easter story. Everything from this dawn at the tomb to the farewell promise to always be there. If Jesus is your primary teacher, the one whose parables and stories, whose life is an example you are called to follow, then knowing he is alive, always alive, is a blessing indeed. It opens up this chance for a personal relationship with him, of his presence in your life as more than a book or a story. And for this reason, so many Christians around the world, as we will later, will sing and celebrate, sing alleluias this morning for the promise. But not everyone has had such an easy time with this story. Thomas Jefferson, a deist with strong Unitarian leanings, was not a fan, as many of you know, of the miraculous parts of the Bible. Jesus, I mean, not Jesus, Jefferson, excuse me, Jesus. <laughs> Boy, there are so many differences there, but we won't go into them. <laughs> Jefferson, in fact, was famous for taking a pair of scissors and cutting the miracle stories out of the Gospels. What was left is now called the Jefferson Bible. A man of science, Jefferson didn't have a, a place for such things in his faith. Others would challenge Jefferson for this. And when asked once about whether he was, in fact, a Christian, Jefferson's ready answer was, I am a true Christian. I am a disciple of the teachings of Jesus. We get that. Perhaps some of us are like Jefferson, not at all interested or believing in the miracle stories of the Bible or anywhere else they show up. Others of us, I imagine, might be more agnostic about it all. 
That is, we might want to believe in a God who splits the seas to free the oppressed and raises Jesus from the dead, but, well, it's impossible to know it really happened without being there. So we table the issue. As Augustine wrote, miracles are not contrary to nature, but only contrary to what we know about nature. In other words, who knows? So we maybe adapt a wait-and-see attitude, meanwhile, anchoring our faith and understanding of it, like Jefferson, in what lies outside the talk of miracles and wonders. Personally, I love to hear the stories ancient and Lisa Nicole of the recent week two of miracles and wonders and think of all the possibilities that such stories point to in the great mystery that is beyond the curtain of our knowing. And my own experience of what was powerful and beyond understanding shaped my life still does. But what if the miracle stories weren't really the point? The late Reverend Dr. Peter Gomes, formerly chaplain at Harvard University's Memorial Chapel, once said that perhaps religious folk got too caught up in asking whether or not or how miracles could have happened. Perhaps all of that is missing the point. Quote, the question to put about a miracle is not, is it true, he writes, or even how can this be, but rather, what does it say? A miracle is a way to convey a message. So it begs the question, then, what is the message of all this, of this Easter story and its wonders. Along these lines, the late professor of theology at Princeton Seminary, Diogenes Allen, observed mysteries to be known must be entered into. So this time of the year, we are invited to do just that, to enter into the story and see what it is each of us finds there, like those stars in the night sky that we find when we look for them bright enough to anchor and orient ourselves day after day. The Holy Week story, everything Leading up to this morning, the Palm Sunday entrance, the trial with its trumped-up charges, the journey to the cross, the suffering on it. Well, it's a story of human cruelty first and foremost, is it not? I mean, part of entering into the story is one awful reminder of what we human beings are capable of and need to be on our watch for in ourselves and ready to respond to in the world. Whether it's the danger of going along with the crowd or the perils of envy or of getting too used to tolerating another's suffering. Are we the king this year? Are we the crowd? Are we the one martyred? It is also a story of the loss of hope, the leaderlessness we feel at times, sometimes when leaders are needed most. Do we feel that? It is a story of staking your heart on things that you believe in, like those disciples who leave their lives for a life of no promises or comforts. About loving deeply, 
other people even knowing loss is always on the other side of love. Entered into this way, the Holy Week story is for those times that we give away our insurance policy on the protected heart and risk ourselves. The story is also about life when tragedy hits and our lives take abrupt turns into something unfamiliar, right? It's about life like it was for the disciples on the beginning of Easter Saturday and Easter Sunday in the face of chasms of incredible uncertainty. In other words, in other words, Holy Week and Easter, well, it's a series of familiar and timeless human stories woven into one. For Elaine Pagels, it was seeing her story reflected in the Easter story that changed her understanding of it. Pagels, a scholar of religion, lost her son Chris when he was six to a congenital heart condition. Walking into the church to plan the memorial service, she hears someone reading from the gospel according to John, preparing, she realizes, for the Good Friday service. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, she hears the reader in tone, and suddenly she knows what is not true for her. The interpretation of the Easter story that says that one of the Easter miracles was that God sent down his son Jesus to suffer and die for our sins. Our only son had just died, she writes, and at that moment I felt that any God that did that for whatever reason would have to be crazy. Pagels, though, was a scholar of religion whose work came to center around a group of early Christian writings that never made it into the canon. They were voted off the island, writings called the Gnostic Gospels. These writings offered a different perspective than those that ended up winning the battle for legitimacy. And it was in these non-canonical, even heretical texts that she finds the truth she knows. In the so-called gospel of truth, Jesus is sent into the world because God sees that humanity is suffering. A humanity that has forgotten its way back to the holy, both inside itself and in relationship to each other and in the world. And into this suffering, Jesus is sent as a teacher, a gift to lead humankind back to itself. That humanity is so evil and so lost that it condemns the man sent as a gift and tortures him. That is not something God controls or chooses. It is just another symptom of what God is so brokenhearted about that compels God to try and save humanity and rescue it from itself. This God is a God with one arm tied behind their back. No control over people, but the ability to step into this world, to incarnate part of themselves, to risk on reunion and resurrection of a kind. This God this interpretation Pagels can get behind. And the Easter miracle in this story is not so much the empty tomb or vicarious atonement for sins, but it's this, this story of a love so big it would risk everything to try and save those it loves 
endure every vulnerability, choose a chance at rescuing the suffering over safety and control of oneself, and even knowing the outcome would choose the same choice again and again for eternity. That's a love Pagel knows is true and holy and a miraculous force when it enters the world. She knows that because it's the kind of love she has, she had for her child. How the rock rolled back, whether a body can be resurrected, may not be the point of Easter. The miracles may be true and they may be more so a way to communicate a message. And what would it be? Perhaps that those who have gone before and the holy that breathes through these stories wants us to know that death doesn't win, that life and love win. That human cruelty might claim a day in fact. Evil will claim the day far too often, as it did this morning. But that human goodness is also real and deeply resilient and can rise like a phoenix from the ashes, and it will. like the followers of Jesus, for example, who don't give up when the teacher and the friend they love is murdered. Instead, this arguing, debating, ragtag group of people will struggle to figure out what the life and teachings of this man they loved and lost was all about, and others will too through time, and sure, Many are going to get it wrong and pervert it for their own needs, but some will stake their lives on it and heal a thousand hearts and chain themselves to fences in honor of causes of justice and live with the poor and lift the dying out of the streets of Calcutta and do uncountable acts of charity unseen because of someone who talked to the good Samaritan who does not walk by the hurt and beaten in the road, because someone said if they ask for your shirt, give them your cloak too, because someone said we should turn the other cheek, because vengeance, however justified, just leaves the whole world blind, because someone said to the violently self-righteous about to do evil in the name of good, yes, Cast the first stone, but only if you yourself are as pure as the driven snow and the stones dropped at their own feet. Because a voice echoing back through time said, just do this. Just free the captives and feed the hungry. Just love one another. And to this day, some people do just that, and not because of the miracle stories. I don't think so. But because what that person said makes sense some place deep inside. Millennia ago, on this morning, some folks woke convinced the world was a bad place on which to stake their hopes. And at the tomb, the symbol of all that they had lost, they got the miracle and the message of Easter. And it said, despite all the odds, and in the face of loss and even evil, Risk on the world, risk on love, on each other, 
practice resurrection. That's the message I'm taking this year, at least. I hope you find yours. Find the thing that brings you back from life's edges. As the poet says, pulls us all so close we ignite. Find the thing that illuminates what you had almost forgotten to believe in, the impossibly possible. The bright spark of resurrection wherever it lies in wait for the tinder of our hearts. Happy Easter, everyone. May alleluias and angels attend thee through all the rough and gorgeous places of this world. Amen.